Have you ever had an idea that was so clear it was like a 3D movie? Have you ever told a friend about the idea and they told you, wow, if you could only make that into a business, you would be rich? Sound familiar? Welcome to Knowledge to Currency. I'm your host, Senator Porter, with my co-host, Roosevelt Williams III, and we're here to help you take action. This is free information. We only ask one thing, build a strong foundation and mindset. We have insight to help you get started. Most of us just need a push. What's up, what's up? Welcome to episode 35 of Knowledge to Currency. I'm your host, Senator Porter, and you are? Roosevelt Williams III. And we have Eric Ty from Fiducia Home Loans. How you doing today? I'm doing excellent, man. Thanks for the invite. Fantastic. Um, so we want to talk about your business. We want to talk about you, family, and what have you. Um, you're an expert in the field of mortgage and real estate um, and a person that I'm very fond of in the industry. So um, I want to first thank you for taking your time to come on to the show because, you know, we only have so much of that. So the fact that you are willing to grace us with your presence, we appreciate that. Yeah, so, I, I, I appreciate you guys. Yeah, absolutely. 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 Um, let's kind of go into some of the stuff you do. So obviously you, you are a owner of a mortgage company. Yeah. Um, let's talk about your mortgage company. Yeah. So Fiducia Home Loans, we started back in 2021. Mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, let's rewind a little bit, right? right. So uh, I started in the, in the loan industry back in 2009. Yep. Uh, I came to San Diego from Sacramento, grew okay. up in Sacramento. Uh, and uh, at that time I had moved with my girlfriend who then became my wife, my my daughter's mom. Sure. And uh, during that time, I kind of didn't really know what I wanted to do. I was a 22 year old kid, yeah. had no direction in life, sure. knew that my daughter was on the way. So I had to do something that made me some kind of money. Yeah. Um, so I ended up uh, hooking up with a debt settlement company, working customer service, had been in sales all my life, but that was the only job that I could find at the time. Uh, the owner's name was John Lee. Okay. And John uh, p came in three weeks after I started and said, hey, just let everybody know you're, you're all out. I just sold to a bigger institution. Uh, it's everybody's last day. Oh, and just like uh, announced it that way? Just like that. I was like, why did I even get hired? So uh, <laughs> three weeks into it, uh, he said that. And then he said, Eric, do me a favor, come into my office real quick. I've, I've heard some of your recorded phone calls and mm -hmm. you're a sales guy. You're not a customer service guy. So what are you doing here? Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm desperate, man. I, I, I was desperate for a job. I got a kid on the way. And he was like, I want to present an opportunity to you. Uh, I'm opening up a mortgage company. Mm -hmm. And I need loan officers and nice. you would be my first one if you're interested. Nice. And so let me set you up for an interview with my sales manager, Philip Barely. Philip and I hit it off. He said, you're my guy. I uh, came on as the first loan officer of Blue Fi Direct Mortgage in Carlsbad, who okay. then became Blue Fi Lending. Okay. That was my foot in the door in mortgage. Uh, so that was 2009. I left the industry for a short period of time in 14 and 15, came back in at mid-15 uh, and started working for a broker, then went to iMortgage, who then became Loan Depot. Loan Depot, yep. Yep. So at Loan Depot, uh, I ended up uh, doing that for about a three and a half year period. Uh, the last year and a half of it, I went direct retail. I, I wanted to do my own loans instead right. of supporting everybody else. Right. So I ended up um, uh, going off my own. At that time, we had what's called an MSA contract. You probably know what that is. Yes, sir. MSA contract with uh, Keller Williams in East County, San Diego, in El mm -hmm. Cajon. So I started uh, brick and mortar in there, working with all the agents, did a, a good amount of business, and then accepted an offer in mid-2018 with J.P. Morgan Chase. Okay. Ended up leaving for Chase. Uh, and recruited back as the team leader of Keller Williams in 2019. Wow. So July of 2019 until September of last year, I was leading uh, Keller Williams in East County while doing loans on the side. Nice. And I had already known that I really wanted to open up a mortgage company, kind of make my own decisions, do my own thing. And at that time, I was talking to the broker owner of Keller Williams, and we were like, let's go in on this. Nice. So I grabbed a couple of partners. And um, we went in, started this company with my friend Nick Harris. Uh, yeah. What up, Nick? What's up, Nick? Shout out, Nick. <laughs> Shout uh, out, to Nick. We actually just came back from uh, Detroit, uh, oh, Michigan. D Town. Yeah, we were up at the uh, UWM headquarters mm -hmm. uh, doing kind of like a sales fundamentals training. Uh, brought on a couple extra teammates, a couple extra loan officers. Ruben Madrigal, you probably know him. Yeah. He's for, uh, he spent 20 something years in the banking industry, did loans for the bank at uh, US Bank, right. our Union Bank. Okay. And so he realized they say that. They, they merge. 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, when, when big banks merge like that, a lot of things change, oh, you yeah. know, it causes a lot of waves and yep. things of that nature. So he was like, you know what, it's not really a fit for me anymore. Uh, and plus, I heard you guys over on the broker side of things doing big things. Right. So I want I want a piece of that. Right. So uh, he ended up joining him. us. Yeah. Yeah, he joined us with a couple of other loan officers. So we were all in uh, Pontiac, Michigan, flew into Detroit, uh, was in Pontiac, did two days there, had a lot of fun, met a lot of new people, mm -hmm. uh, and it just had a great time. That's awesome. Yeah. So um, you, you got basically into the industry right when, like, Obama was in office. Yeah. So um, in 2008, 2009, for people that don't know, um, obviously we had a meltdown. And it wasn't like awesome to be in the business for until probably like his second year of his first term. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, our, our paths are very similar because mm -hmm. when I got into the mortgage industry, I had a daughter, a new daughter, and I needed a job. And I got um, a job at a collection for U.S. Bank for mortgages. Mm -hmm. And the first day I was like, oh, I don't want to do this. Like, this is a terrible job. Yeah. But my really close friend, he's like my little brother. He worked there and he was working at Taco Bell. So this was an up sell from yeah, working yeah. at Taco Bell. Yeah. But for me, it was not. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I told him I would work there until the probationary period would end. Yeah. So he would get his money for getting me hired. And then I wanted something else. Yeah. So like literally I worked there first couple of days I was collecting because all you had to do was call and say, hey, Eric, it looks like your payment is about five, 10 days late. Right. Um, we're giving you a courtesy call. And most people that you talk to at that point, they're like, oh, shoot, I was traveling or whatever. Right. Can you take a check over the phone? Yeah. And you're like, cool. I'm booking checks. So yeah. they're like, oh, yeah, you're really good. So I'm like, uh-oh. So then they're like, yeah, so um, we're going to put you with people that are 30 days late. So those calls, still collecting checks, but not as fun. Yeah. Then two months behind, three months behind, and so forth. So by my probationary period, I was like, hey, I got to get out of here. So yeah. I went to a job fair, handed out my resume, and the guy looks at it. He goes, oh, I see you got mortgage experience. I was like, no, sir, I think you're mistaken. <laughs> I I work in collections at U.S. Bank. He goes, no, no, it says mortgage here. And he winks at me. And I was like, okay. He goes, I want you to um, go to this office on Monday and I got an opportunity for you. So that opportunity ended up being a mortgage gig, mm -hmm. and that's how I got into mortgage. Nice. And then they trained me on everything I needed to know, and, you know, 25 years later, here we are, you know, so nice. crazy. So it's very similar. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I have to say, you know, anytime your name comes up in conversation with, you know, any of my circle, I, one thing that I always say is you have this really, really smooth voice. Nice. That I think if I you did collections, if you called me, I'd be like, <laughs> take, take my money, bro. <laughs> You're so calming. It's like, hey, you know, you owe some money, right? You, you don't pay today? <laughs> nah, you, you can't, you can't say it that way, but you, you gotta, you gotta talk to them. A lot of people hanging up on you. Yeah. It was a tough job. Like, but the sad part is there's people that didn't think there was anything better for them. Yeah. And Fortunately for me, I, I did other stuff. So I was like, yeah, this is okay for now. Like you said, you got a kid, you got to yeah. make a living. Right. I mean, so that's understandable, but you got to keep propelling to yeah. get better. So it's good that that's something that you were able to do. Yeah. You're not doing collections anymore <laughs> <laughs> or sales or any of that stuff. We Actually, we have that in common because uh, I don't know if you remember, uh, in 2010, interest rates skyrocketed. Kind yeah. of what we're experiencing exactly. today, right? Exactly. Within a, a few weeks, interest rates went up half, three quarters of a percent. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were huge on refi. So anybody that we talked to in the last 30, 60 days were just completely gone because yeah. they were like, why would I want that half a percent higher rate? Right. So I was out of a job. Uh, I ended up hooking up with a collection company. Okay. Um, did that for about two and a half months. Worst two and a half months of my Ever. life, man. It's just Ever. Shout so out to depressing. the collectors, yeah. man. If you could take that, man, yeah. you're strong people. Hey, you know what? Shout out Sherry Mosdell. She spent <laughs> 20 plus years in the oh collection my game. Oh, goodness. And, and I, when she talks about it, she seems kind of proud about it, too. Like, I got so much money from these people. Um, but yeah, you know, two and a half months of collections told me that I should never go back to collections. Exactly. Yeah. It's exactly. just the worst, worst industry to be in. It's just do so depressing, man. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And, and you know, some, and especially with the mill down there, so many people that were either, we would call folks that, uh, they, they were told that you should buy a house because that's the American dream. Right. They said, Hey, based on my income, I can't afford it. And they're like, no, no, we got a program that can help you. Yeah. 
And then, they, you know, they do a no-doc loan for them. Yep. They get them in the house. And that was cool when it was a uh, interest-only, mm-hmm. you know, arm. They're barely making the payment as it is. And yep. then they would always tell them, oh, don't worry. You're, gonna, you're young. You're going to make more money. Yeah. <laughs> and now they get to us and they're like, hey, this guy told me this. And I went back to the office. The office is closed. And mm. yeah. it was sad, you know. Yep. So I'm glad things aren't like that today. You know, and that's a good point to make. A lot of people, a lot of the consumers now think that what we're experiencing is a replay of 2008. Correct. And for, for the whole audience that's going to be watching this, I want to emphasize that this looks nothing like 2008. Nothing it's like very, it. very different. Mm-hmm. Um, and just like you said, you know, the interest onlys, the balloon payments, the neg ams, right? Mm-hmm. You have a negatively amortized loan. You cannot give a consumer three options of payments to choose from. <laughs> you, you cannot because they're always going to choose the lowest one. <laughs> right. Well, guess what? The lowest the lowest payment is a negatively amortized payment, which means that if you are paying less than interest, if just interest only is a thousand dollars and you're making an eight hundred dollar payment, they didn't understand that two hundred dollars is tacked on to principal. Never pay it off. So every month your principal grows versus, you know, getting getting smaller. Right. So a lot of those people actually didn't understand what kind of loans they were getting into. It was very easy to get a loan. Um, I myself got into the business in 2009, so a year mm-hmm. after the crash. So I didn't go through the whole 2001, 2008 craze. Um, I and did. I'm, <laughs> I'm actually glad I didn't because if I did, I don't even think I'd be sitting here today. I think I would have just lost myself. No, nah, you would have. You would, but... It was, like you said, anyone that's gotten to the industry in the last two years, they were in Candyland. They didn't yeah. understand, like, how hard it is to be oh, yeah. a professional. And you got people fighting over the house and, you know, sight unseen offers and yeah. all that. Nah, but in the time you got in, there, there are tons of houses on the market. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, we got trained the right way. Yeah. Yeah, let's put it that way. because, And that's also another very, very good point is a lot of the agents, I don't know, I think the statistics said that 91% of agents today have never sold a piece of property, a home, over a 6% interest rate market. Wow. Okay, that tells you something. Yeah. Well, they yeah. were selling hotcakes, right. right? I mean, properties... People are just buying homes left and right. Interest rates were super, super low. Mm-hmm. You know, it's very easy to sell a two and a half percent interest rate to a home buyer. It's oh, yeah. very hard to sell a seven and a half percent interest rate. Yep. Right? Yeah. Well, even just comparing what kind of interest rates we saw at the beginning of last year versus what we're seeing today, you're, I mean, people are quoted a four and a half percent, five percent interest rate. If their interest rate seven and a half percent, and they're financing six hundred thousand, that's hundreds and hundreds of dollars extra that they have they have to pay for a month, sure. right? That means, I mean, just using quick math, every ten thousand dollars finance is fifty dollars difference in payment. Right. If you are looking at a three hundred dollar higher payment, you got to drop your oh, purchase oh, price yeah. by sixty grand at least, right? or or get rid of some other expense. Exactly. You know, so, which is tough. Yeah, it's so so it's very hard for these agents to survive. And I already know of a few handfuls that have said, hey, I just cannot survive. I'm not getting any business. I'm going to have to go get a full-time job. Dang. And I think you're going to see a lot more of that. Anytime you see a market shift like this and people are not prepared and they don't pivot, they're going to start leaving the industry. Every shift, there's a 40 to 60% washout of agents and loan officers that just cannot make the cut. Well, I mean, and that's, I mean, in a way, it's kind of good um, to have the people that are not professionals like yeah. yourself and don't understand the industry um, and get the people that really know what's going on to help people. Because it's a shame when you talk to somebody that didn't have someone that had the best training yeah, and they're helping them buy such a big purchase. And that guy started like six months ago. Yeah. Like, I mean, depending on who his mentor is, that could be a bad thing. Exactly. Um, so let's talk about that. So how, how are you um, kind of proactively helping your, your team be prepared for these, these times that we're in today? Role plays, man. Role okay. plays and script practices are my jam. Uh, yeah. That's kind of like my space okay. because I don't feel like you can be a good salesperson if you don't practice your craft. Right? Sure. You look at all the greatest athletes in the world, you know, the Michael Jordans and Kobe Bryant's. Peyton Manning's, they don't practice once in a while. They right. practice every day for hours. They make it their life's work. That okay. is why who they who they are who they are, right? right? So I see a lot of these agents, and not to knock anybody, you're going to do your own thing. Right. I can only say so much to improve you. I cannot care about your business more than you. Sure. So I've learned a huge lesson last year. 
I can count on two hands how many times I got screwed over uh, just because, <laughs> no. yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I, I'm a super nice dude. I, mm -hmm. I always try to help anybody that needs help. But what I realized is that once they get that help, you're a nobody to them, right? Yeah. And they will do whatever is necessary to make their, their dollar, uh, even if it means that you don't make anything, right? Which is crazy. Yeah, <laughs> and it hurts a little bit. You know, yeah. every time I tell myself I've learned my lesson, I don't, I keep doing it, you know, because mm -hmm. that's just who I am. And I've realized that I need to scale back. You know, I need to scale up my business, but I need to scale back on helping others when they don't appreciate my help. They'll oh, yeah. take and take and take, and they never, ever give. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, 2022 was a rough year. Um, mm -hmm. I, I learned a huge lesson with that. And so this year I made a promise to myself that it's all about me and my people and my circle first before I lend a helping hand to every single person out there. That's a good tip. You know what I mean? You, you have any mortgage related questions asked the professional here? Well, you know what? Uh, I'm gonna keep it all the way a thousand. Which when I buy my house, I let my wife, you know, take care of a lot. <laughs> That's of always the best option. <laughs> you know, everybody's happy, and our property value is going up. So now we're working on our on, on our second home. There you, you go. Know? So I love it. Uh, but, uh, but any tips? Uh, what made you um, have the independent mindset to you know uh, you know be uh, independent? Yeah. Yeah. Great question. So I've worked for a lot of the bigger institutions out there. Like I said, I mortgage loan depot, caliber home loans, mm -hmm. um, chase, right? right. Big, big. Yeah. 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 And, and love them to death. They're all great companies. I'm not here to knock anybody, but what you realize is there's a huge difference when you're talking about a direct lender versus a broker, right? Correct. A direct lender, usually you see many, many layers of management um, and many hands in the pot when it comes to processing, underwriting, and approving a loan, right? So what I experience, and I can only speak on my experience, is when I would need something done, I would go to my manager, my manager would go to his or her manager, and it would keep getting escalated, and by that time, it's like a day and a half, two days later, and I still don't have an answer, I can't operate that way, especially right. in a very competitive market like San Diego and these rate shoppers, you know, they're going to go, hey, that lender is beating you by half a point in cost. Can you drop that cost by 2000? If not, I'm just going to go with them. Right. right. So you need those answers immediately. And I wasn't getting them. Right. Sure. And yeah. sometimes I would get shut down even. Hey, we just can't afford it. So tell them to go elsewhere. Right. right. Mm. And I didn't like losing business that way. I wanted to stay competitive. And then also another thing is when you're talking about underwriters, you know, the biggest thing with direct lenders is, hey, we have in-house underwriters. We, right. We underwrite loans real quick. Right. Well, I, I can appreciate that. But here's the thing. When you have an underwriter in-house, are they really right next door? Right. Or are they in-house as in in your company? Right. right. You can be a San Diego branch, but your headquarters is out of Texas. Sure. So you have a two-hour time difference. So is that really the best way to go? Mm -hmm. I know that as a broker, I have full control over my file. I don't report to a manager anymore. I report to myself. Right. And when I'm talking to anybody that is going to do me a solid, like a manager would at a direct lender, it'd be my account executive at the wholesale lender. Right. Sure. So these account executives, I, I mean, I was just hanging out with them the, a couple of days ago. They're solid, man. They'll, they'll do whatever's necessary to make the deal work for you. Um, the whole trip that the whole team went on to Detroit was paid for by UWM. Nice. You know, wholesale lenders love to take care of us because we give them so much business. Right. It, but it's a reciprocal, reciprocal relationship. But going back to, to your question is, why did I want to go independent? I wanted more control of what I was doing. I didn't want to be in a situation where there's so many layers that need to get paid that my pricing is completely off. Right. Mm -hmm. And so when you take a look at a brokerage, depending on what the broker himself or herself is looking to make on every transaction, every loan, they can make 200 basis points. They can make 50 basis points. They can make 250, 300, depending on where that specific broker is priced is going to be a reflection on what they offer the consumer. So I wanted full control over that. And I wanted to be in a position where if I am going to be competitive, I'm going to drop my commission to make the deal work just like real estate agents do. Right. right? It's only fair. I could not do it as a direct lender. Um, there are some great things with direct lenders, though. They give you all the back and support, like the marketing, like the health insurance, dental, all of that. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, if they require you to be somewhere, they got to pay you to be there. Right. right? I don't really care about all of that though. Right. right? I, I can pay for all of those third party entities myself and I can still have full control over my, my, my files. Um, I can still make decent money, but my consumers can still save money at the same time. 
So I get the, the win-win situation, the best of both worlds. So for, um, if somebody were to do an application with you, how many people are in the chain? So it's you, uh, fulfillment, so a processor, underwriter, and that's it? But, so beginning stages, when we're talking about a pre-approval, you speak with me and me directly. Mm -hmm. uh, you usually click on a link, you apply online. Right. I get the I get the application after you filled it out. I get the documents, I review the file, I push it to my processing manager who sets it up. And if we're going into escrow right away, uh, he sends it to whatever wholesale lender I choose. Sure. Uh, and then he does the communications, he does the processing of the paperwork, he collects the conditions, he submits for initial approval, collects the rest of the conditions to submit for final, he orders appraisal, he, he does all of that. Uh, and the one underwriter that would underwrite the file, why I love the three wholesale lenders that I really use religiously mm -hmm. is because I know exactly who I'm working with. Sure. I know my, my underwriting team. I know the underwriting manager. So if there's anything that goes wrong, knock on wood, mm -hmm. I would call him or her directly and I would say, tell me exactly what's going on with this file and how we fix it. So to kind of educate the audience, so the way he's doing business compared to like a big bank. Like when I worked for Wells Fargo, as an example, 20 to 35 people would touch your file to get mm -hmm. it to closing. Yeah. So for me, I worked there so long, I knew how to get through all the red tape. But if you're working with a new loan officer that doesn't have the connections right. that I would have, it's not going to go as smooth. Exactly. So for me, it would seem like you're only, I did everything, but it was a whole bunch of people that I would message and tell what to do to make sure it, close like that yep so yep. that that will be kind of the big difference so yeah definitely more control over mm -hmm. here is going to be more seamless they're mm -hmm. talking to the boss your name's on the on the, wall, <laughs> on the door you know yeah so absolutely something like that um and then let's talk about some of the organizations that you support um yep. obviously um, aria is one of the ones that yeah. i'm a member of and, and you're very uh i guess um uh, active uh, uh, foundational block of the uh, <laughs> of the organization yeah. right yeah. And shout out Lizzie Lee. Lizzie Lee, uh, I had been a member of ARIA for, I think, three or four years, but I didn't really go to the events. I was just kind of a member because I was like, hey, I'm, I'm Asian. Maybe I should be a part of this organization, <laughs> right? Um, so um, it wasn't until I, I started getting to know Lizzie Lee is mm -hmm. when she was like, hey, you should really check out ARIA. I'm part of the board. You know, come to a board meeting and see, see if you like it. So I did. Uh, and I ended up joining as a floating board member. And then that I think that was 2000. 2018, that okay. was 2018 when I became a board member, a floating board member, and then I became the secretary, and then I became the, or no, I was marketing first, secretary, and then I became the vice president last year, and I EP. continued uh, my vice presidency <laughs> this year. Uh, and I'm, I'm um, slated for presidency in 2024, next year. Maybe a president next? Yeah. Oh man, I mean all the presidents. <laughs> so for people who don't know, Aria is an associate, Asian Association of Realtor. Yep. Um, you don't have to be Asian to join because I joined. <laughs> um, but it's a great community. They um, are fighting for our, our rights and, and looking for you know opportunities to help first time home buyers or you know seasoned investors, whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. But it's cool to be a part of it because no matter where you move, they have chapters all across the country yep. and they can connect you with people in those circles and help you get business or help you to find a home or whatever the case may be. Yeah, yeah, we try to put on uh, at least one event a month and it's always an educational event where realtors, loan officers, title, escrow can come out and learn. Uh, we also throw some wild parties. You know, parties we, are cool. Yeah, we have a, <laughs> a national event every year. Last year was in San Diego. We killed it because because mm -hmm. we were the ones that were delegated to manage the whole thing and plan the whole thing. Nice. Uh, so that was downtown. Did you go? Not last year. Oh, man. It was wild. <laughs> Not last year. I'm sure it was crazy. Yeah. yeah. Shout out Mel <laughs> Sophia. <laughs> Melissa Sophia was the president last year, mm -hmm. and she uh, – took the reins and just threw this wild after party. Uh, and we had a lot of people there. It was really, really fun. I think I went four years ago. Okay. When I was in San Diego. Okay. I went to, I went to Aria and I went to NARAB. Yeah. I think I went to all these national events. They were all, most of them were in San Diego. Yeah. Latitude. Um, yeah. But, um, so as far as, um, what, what do you see? the mortgage industry now, the current market in San Diego, um, what are some of the things you see happening? You know, I, I see a lot of fear, uh, mm -hmm. and rightfully so, right? Because there's a lot of volatility in the market. There's a lot of instability, um, and a lot of things that's coming out in the media that 
I really want to express to the audience out there, whoever's listening and wants to listen, that the media tells you half truths. Yep. Okay. The media has an agenda. Mm. And usually the agenda doesn't work in your favor. No. Right. They want to instill fear in you. So you start moving your money and it causes the market to not do so well. Sure. And that is when the top 1% make the most money. Absolutely. Whenever there's instability in the market, whenever there's a market crash, the top 1% make the most money while the consumers like us suffer. Right. Okay. When you take a look at the 08 crash, when there was the big bank buyout, when there was a lot of people foreclosing and short selling their homes, well, who's buying up these properties? Yeah, you had yeah. some consumers that were buying them out that were in the financial position to do so, but most of them were getting gobbled up by investors. Oh right? yeah, the wealthy. Yeah, yeah, the top 1%. Mm -hmm. You know, when you take a look at the current climate, there's a company called Blackstone. Mm -hmm. you know, Blackstone, you big, Black big Rock. organization mm -hmm. that's buying up a ton of properties, right? You have Chinese investors from overseas, from China, mm -hmm. you know, obviously c communist country. Yep. They, can't, they can't keep their money safe there, so why not take it overseas and invest in the American soil? Right. So now they're buying a ton of properties here, and they're vacant. Yep. It's like, why are you doing that? You know, you, I can understand you're protecting your money, but it also does us a disservice as Americans because it's causing home prices to go up. Sure. So I think that a lot of changes need to be done and had um, by the government. I think that they're doing a lot of things um, really, really wrong. Um, sure. But I'm one person, right? Who am I to say what the federal government does for Americans? I can tell you this is, you know, you've heard of the loan level uh, pricing adjustments, mm -hmm. you know, the uh, tell me why it makes sense to them, to the federal government, to FHFA where a person that's putting down 20% is going to get charged more in closing costs than somebody putting down five. Why? Yeah. That LLPA just makes absolutely no sense. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to start charging people more that have higher than a 40% debt to income. So I can have a 41% debt to income and I get a major hit on my pricing. Right. So it doesn't, it just doesn't make sense. So I don't know if you heard, they came out the news yesterday that F FHFA said, Hey, we heard you guys, we got your complaints. We're going to put that on hold. So at least the DTI hit has right. been put on hold. Right. Um, I think that federal government really needs to hear us out. Uh, I mean, uh, the best way to do it is just, just listen to us, right. listen to us because we are on the battlefield. We are in the trenches. We are doing this every day. All you guys do is dictate and make rules. And I can understand making rules to protect yourselves, right? To protect uh, ourselves from another crash. Sure. But at the end of the day, it needs to make sense, right? Make Curving sense. inflation, all of that. Raising interest rates, I can understand that, but there's a certain threshold that you just don't go over. Sure. Right? What uh, the current market now? Like, are you familiar with how many houses are available in San Diego for sale? You know, I I have that on my phone. I can okay. share with you in a little bit, but um, I know I have I have updates for specific cities. Mm -hmm. I don't have it for the county, but I can find that out. It's the um, last number I I mean, this is obviously from a month ago. Was yeah, less than twenty five hundred homes. I was going to say it's probably somewhere around 2000 right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. So um, that's one of the things that I was going to talk about where it's different from the times in 08, 09, yes. where there were tons of inventory. Right. You know, homes where people weren't going to pay, they couldn't pay, they right. actually just left. Mm -hmm. um, now, if you actually have somebody that says, hey, I can't make the payment, they could list it and sell it yeah. and actually have equity. Exactly. Um, because there was like a shift where they were giving money to everybody to saying, all right, now I need your firstborn. I need, yeah. you know, 25 percent down. Right. So a lot of people are sitting on equity. Um, what would you advise? Like, let's say, for instance, someone were to buy a home and have a really awesome interest rate, but they need some money to like do um, an ADU or something like that. And they want to sacrifice that rate. Yeah, you, you know, depending on the rate, right? Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, I was trained to uh, sell benefits versus features, or okay. benefits over features, right? Okay. The rate is always just a feature of the loan. The benefit is what is your payment going to be, and can you afford it, okay. right? So I would have really have to challenge you to think, let's say you have a 3% interest rate, the current market's 7. Right. Yeah, it's a 4% difference, but are you still saving money? Okay. Right? If you go out and get a personal loan at 12%, is that payment going to be more than what your extra mortgage payment is going to be? Okay. How much higher your mortgage payment is going to be? Because okay. at the end of the day, you can have a 15% interest rate, but if you can afford the payment, you get a house. Okay. Right? It could be a 25% interest rate. It could be a 1% interest rate. The rate does not matter. What is your payment? 
your payment matters, right? So uh, to answer your question, I would say if they have like a two and a half percent interest rate, which a lot of the Americans now right. do, have um, look into a HELOC, you okay. know, look into potentially um, getting a, a, some sort of personal loan if the interest rate makes sense. If you have decent credit, there's a lot of personal loan options out there that are under double digits, you know, that would probably make more sense for you instead of refinancing the $450,000 balance at a 7% rate just to get $20,000 cash. It just doesn't make sense. So yeah. predicated on how much you want and cash out and what your current interest rate is and what that extra payment would be. And then a HELOC is a home equity line of credit. So it's basically a second mortgage. So when you get that mortgage, it doesn't affect your first mortgage. Correct. So if you had two and a half, like you said, and you only needed uh, 20000 you can get a home equity line of credit for $50,000. That's usually good for up to 10 years or some go longer, but yeah. we'll just use 10 years as an example. You use the 20, add the ADU onto the home, and then you have two mortgage payments. But the principal loan is stays um, in place and it doesn't affect it. Second mortgage, you can pay that down, get the work done that you need on the house, yep. and then you can also keep that account available if you ever need the money again. So it's a good tool to have at the present time. Yeah, it's just like a credit card, you know, yeah. and you don't pay interest on the money that you don't use. So if you have a $500,000 HELOC, home equity line of credit, but you have not used a dime, you're not paying any interest on that money. And if you do use it, um, because it's a mortgage, it should be tax of, um, uh, benefits to it the same right. as your first mortgage. Right. Talk to your CPA. Yeah, we're not tax <laughs> advisors, but like I said, it should. Got to have that fine print. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, building an ADU, you know, they have ADU financing available as well. Nice. Um, and so ADUs, just knowing people building ADUs in the normal costs, it's not going to be 20,000. Uh, right. It's going to be more like 75, 100, 150,000. Mm -hmm. And if you're looking at that kind of number, then it might make more sense to cash out. Refi. Refi. Yeah. Even if you're looking at, you know, $2,000 higher in payment, what are you going to charge for rent on the ADU? Because sure. you might have a complete washout sure. of that of that extra payment. Would they would you count that? So let's say they did the full refi and they're gonna do mm -hmm. ADD, would you count the rental income or do they have to wait to rent it? You know, that was a discussion that we just had, I think last week, and my partner was gonna look into it. And I don't believe you can use ADU rental That's income. That's what I thought. Yeah. 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 yeah For qualifying gonna, purposes. Because it's gonna take a while to build in and, and yeah. what have you, right? Exactly. You had a question? question? No, I'm learning so much. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, I'm taking copious notes. Um, I'm definitely uh, inspired and want to learn more about the industry. Yeah. But I really um, am fascinated by your story um, uh, and what motivates you to, you know, to build and grow. And uh, so what keeps you excited? You know, uh, seeing my kids, man, you know, and to kind of get on a more of a personal note, I, I grew up really without, you know, my dad being a major part of my life. Uh, I was born in Hong Kong, right, Hong Kong. Uh, and uh, when I came over when I was four, my dad needed a few years to build his business. So from uh, a, the, the age of four to seven, I lived with my uncle and other family members. And then it wasn't until at the age of seven is when he invited me to go live with him in Daly City, which is mm. the suburbs of San Francisco. Nice. And so I spent three years up there uh, and, um, after that, we moved back to Sacramento. So from the age of 10 until 22, I was living in Sacramento. Uh, but during that time, like for example, from, uh, from basically seven until 14, I was living with my dad, but my dad took off to, to Hong Kong again. He was like, hey, I'm just moving back to Hong Kong. You know, you're, <laughs> you're 14 years old, you know, you can go back, you know, go back to your uncle, live with him <laughs> for the next four years. You'll be 18 in four years anyway. You know, you don't need me. And so he moved mm -hmm. back to Hong Kong with my, with my mom. And <laughs> so I was, you know, in 14 to 18, those are the worst years, <laughs> right? You, you become, you kind of like find yourself during those years, right? So I, I found myself to not be that good of a dude, <laughs> right? Cause I had no, I had no, you know, father figure there to teach me what was right and what was wrong, to, to teach me financial literacy, mm -hmm. you know, to teach me that you actually had to pay credit cards back, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so at the age of 18, I applied for everything. I got everything. I mm -hmm racked up all this debt and just didn't know how to manage it. Sure. So, you know, saying all that, I said all that to say this is, you know, growing up without that major fatherly or motherly figure in my life has taught me to give my kids everything that I've got. Sure. Um, you know, if it's not money, it's my time. If it's not my time, it's my energy, whatever I have on my plate that I can give them, I will. Right. 
And so I, I hope, you know, saying all this, they grow up to be decent kids. They, they already are, you know, they're, they're awesome kids. I have a 13 year old daughter, Genevieve. Mm-hmm. I love to death, you know, and, and Riker who just turned eight, mm-hmm. also awesome. You know, both mm-hmm. really, really good kids, really good heads on their shoulders. Uh, and so I'm a proud dad. Nice. Um, but to answer your question, you know, what gets me excited? What, what gets me up in the morning? What keeps me going? Why do I have a scaling mindset to build businesses is to leave a legacy for the kids. Good. That's super that's, awesome. That's yeah. the word, legacy. You know what I'm saying? That's wonderful. He yeah. likes that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, big on legacy, uh, honey, you're playing. Mm-hmm. So definitely, uh, you know, uh, being foresighted and uh, be able to, um, you know, uh, set others up for success. Yep. And uh, so that's all a part of it. So yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you're a man on the mission, and I'm glad that you're able to find yourself between those wonder years. Yeah. Because those wonder years are so important, and uh, the goal, what keeps me motivated, is to be able to have those resources to be able to take care of my heirs through their wonder years. Yeah. Because they're gonna wonder. We all wonder. We all wonder. You know, what's gonna be our favorite color? What's our favorite shoe? Yeah. Who's our friends? Yeah. Where we're going? Are we coming or going? So I'll be able to have those resources to those wonder years, and it sounds like you're setting it up for success. Yeah. Yeah. And because I didn't have that between Some else. <laughs> Some else. <laughs> but because I didn't have that, you know, between 14 and 18 and not to knock my uncle, but, you know, he had three kids, you know, sure. my grandma lived with him as well. So his hands were full. Right. Um, but, you know, being there between 14 and 18, not really getting the attention that you desperately need during that age, you need that guidance. Yeah, I, I was a pretty bad dude. Man. I got in a lot of trouble, you know, with the law and everything. Um, yeah. Thank God that I did all the, the, the stuff that I did before I turned 18. So, right. you know, I'm not gonna go into it. That might be a different podcast, but um, right. but yeah, you know, I learned my lesson, you know, and my goal is to teach my kids not to go that route, right? It's not worth it, you, you know? And if I was unlucky enough where I did that just a few weeks after, mm-hmm. Be, I probably wouldn't be here. Be here now. Yeah, mm. I'd probably be doing construction. You know? mm. like, that's yeah. how much your life can change by mm. one choice, yeah. right? No, I mean, uh, we interviewed a guy when I was in Florida. He, he crushed the interview, super guy, great mm-hmm. guy, came in from New York. And um, we were like, all right, we just got to do your background check, and mm-hmm. we should be able to hire you. Background check came back, and he had a DWI. Mm-hmm. So you're like, oh, mm. dang, that's too bad. And then they call us. They're like, yeah, we can't hire this dude in New York. That's a felony. Oh, wow. So call a guy up. He goes, yeah, I had a DWI, but I was younger. He's only right. like 22 years old. Right. Now he's 35. Oh, and man. he can't work at, at least at that company I was at at the time because that's considered a felony. Right. So he couldn't pass the, the background check. Jeez. And you're like, man, you know, like you said, one decision, you do, you do something wrong and it could follow you forever. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. so that's good that that didn't happen to you. Yeah. You know, it's, it's crazy, right? Because uh, in 2010, 2011, I, I met this dude uh, mm-hmm. and, and he brought out Sacramento Eric again, you know, <laughs> and it wasn't by choice, man. I, I, I didn't want sec- I didn't want to see Sacramento Eric ever again, but, but he, you know, it's so crazy how God just tests you, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Whenever you think you're just dominating, it's like, here's a hurdle for you to handle, right? <laughs> This Mm. truth. Um, Met this dude. He was two years older than me, was married around the same age as me. His daughter was the same, you know, with just one kid, you know, daughter. His daughter was exactly 14 days older than my daughter, uh, was from Sacramento, living in San Diego. Mm. I'm like, you're like a long lost brother, man. (laughs) We need to be best friends right away. Mm. Well, he took me down the wrong path and I lost myself for two and a half years. Dang, Mm. really? Two and a half years, I lost myself. I lost everything. everything that you can imagine and we're not just talking about finances we're talking relationships we're talking marriage we're talking you know Mm. my relationship with my child right Um, I let him completely engulf my life because I was so attracted to the brotherhood that Mm. could be sure right and so um, yeah for two and a half years lost myself um, and spent the next three and a half four years recovering everything that I had lost I'm proud to say that, you know, during that time, you know, I lost my relationships with my parents, lost my relationship with my daughter. We're getting real personal now. Right. Um, (laughs) You know, lost my marriage, um, lost, lost my bank accounts, lost my truck, lost everything. Right. Because of this dude. Right. And so um, after going through all that, I'm proud to say that I spent the next four years recovering uh, everything that I had lost and and I'm making back triple. 
Good. Right. Um, for you. My daughter and I have a great relationship now. Um, even mom and I are getting along. You know, Good. I have another kid now. He he's an awesome, awesome little dude. Right. Uh, my parents love me. They're proud of me of whatever I'm accomplishing now. Every time I talk to them, I have new news of the next thing Good that I'm thing. doing. Yeah. You know what I mean? So That's it just right. feels good, man. It feels really, really good that what they say, the cliche thing that they say is you got to hit rock bottom to start climbing back up. And that's sure. exactly what I did. I hit rockiest of the rock bottom. Dang. Mm. Yes, man. That's, rockiest of the rock bottom. Well, I'm glad you're back. Yes. 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 Every, like I told him, everybody loves the comeback story, baby. Yes. That's oh, what man. it's about. Yes. Every time I tell the, the actual detailed story, every person that I tell it to is like, write a book. Yeah. Write a book. You should, man. There's now, so many chapters. Now man. you can do it. Chat GPT. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Write a story about Eric Tyler. <laughs> <laughs> any, any big announcements before we let you go? Uh, big announcements. Uh, I want to give a shout out. Uh, well, there's one that I can't really name yet, but uh, shout out Ruben Madrigal. Hey, all right, uh, Ruben. What Ruben, up, Ruben? Yeah, Ruben. Uh, welcome to Fiducia, man. You're crushing it. I'm so proud to be in partnership with you. Shout out Nick Harris. You're an awesome partner. Shout out um, to Nick. Yeah, shout out Joe Garzanelli, Sherry Farrell, other partners of Fiducia. They're awesome, awesome people in East County, San Diego. Uh, shout out to Keller Williams out there in East County. Yep. Love all the agents there. Really, really good vibe. Um, and shout out Aria, you know, yeah. Aria fam, Aria, Aria sisters and brothers, shout out NARAP, you NARAP know, shout out well. NARAP. Yeah, NARAP. Um, I love these organizations because they're fighting for what's good. Right. Right. Um, what we're experiencing right now is a huge shortage of minority home ownership. And, yeah. and before we, you guys let me go, I just yeah. want to touch on that. I think it's something that needs to be talked about. It, mm -hmm. It's something that a lot of people shy away from, you know, uh, there's a huge discrepancy. Uh, of home ownership between all other races versus black and Hispanics. Right. And that needs to be addressed. Right. I feel that uh, our trip to DC is exactly for that cause is we need to let everybody know that something needs to be done. Okay. Right. It's unfair. Okay. It's unfair that there's, there's not enough opportunities for minorities to get into home ownership that they're always held down. Right. I agree. Um, and we need to lead the way. We need to show them what kind of opportunities are out there, mm -hmm. what kind of programs can help you. If you need down payment assistance, let's work on that. If you right. need to improve your credit, let's work on that. But it does not make sense that you keep renting for the rest of your life and ha establish no equity position. Right? And no legacy. No yeah. legacy. Yeah, man, that's poverty pimping. That's a uh, redlining. Right. You know that's absolutely. <laughs> I know individuals yeah. that's not going to ever be able to buy a home because yeah. of the uh, the plan that was put in place. Right. Yep. You know to hold them to hold them back. They'll be renters the rest of their lives, yep. uh, paying mortgages. Yep. And it's unfortunate that that they'll be able to get that. So. Um, Sharing that financial literacy piece and demonstrations, but also you know cutting that red ta that red tape, that yep. bureaucracy, having responsible banking ordinances mm -hmm. in place. So right. when you walk into a bank, you got, you can actually see the grade on the front door. How how friendly are mm -hmm. they with their loans? Yeah, I'm listening and I'm learning a whole lot. Yes. But I thought I'd just share that piece. Yeah, I but love it. Definitely it. inspired. I love it. I love it. So that's a big deal. And, and I really want the audience out there, if you guys can support us, you know, if you guys uh, join an organization like NARAB, uh, NARREP, ARIA, Aria, please come out and just learn. Yeah, right? Learn because the worst thing that we can do is turn a blind eye, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that's what I've seen a lot of people do is well, it doesn't affect me. So why do I care? Right. right? Well, you should care. It still right? affects you, though. Yeah. If the, if that's the thing that people don't realize is. When you have people struggling financially, that's when they start to do bad things like right. crime, sell drugs, exactly. all those different things. So if you got a crazy mortgage payment, you got to go to work. You ain't yeah. going to be robbing anybody because you're like, I got to pay this bill. I exactly. got to go to work. Exactly. Um, so so it, it affects you if you believe it or not. Mm -hmm. Yes, that environmental justice piece. When you own homes, you might want to be that baseball little league coach. Sure. Pop Warner coach helps yeah. the environmental justice for all. We're all mm -hmm. in the same ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. And, and the cancel culture is crazy because, like I said, everyone loves a comeback. So we don't want to look at um, at your past and just keep you there because you build yourself to a different person. So the person yeah. you were when you're 19, you're not that same person when you're 30, exactly. 45. So as you grow, as you learn, as you see more, you change. Yeah. But it's like nowadays, you know, you can't ever make a mistake. You got to be Will Smith. And even Will Smith had trouble, you know. Yeah. So yeah. You know, like every, everyone has ups and downs in life. And 
you can't just harp on somebody's bad choices if they're trying to do better today. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Mm-hmm. Wait, but are y'all Team Will Smith or Team Chris Rock? Bro? <laughs> <laughs> I, gotta, I gotta get that straight. <laughs> yeah, I don't look at Will the same. Race, <laughs> that was kind of lame, but yeah, <laughs> man. And you know, I I'm a big fan of Chris Rock. I, right. I love Will Smith Smith to death, but right. I just think he made a really really bad mistake. Yeah, like damn, mm. bro. Like, why'd you do it? It's like, man, you ruined it for me, man. Like, why'd you have to do that, man? <laughs> right. Like, Chris right. Rock did nothing to you. It was right. a simple joke. Right. Exactly. But it is what it is. Exactly. It is what it is. Yeah, my two cents. If I had to add on that, you know, he had an executive isolation. Mm-hmm. You know, he was an eagle in a chicken coop. And what mm-hmm. I mean by that is, you know, he didn't know how to express himself. Yes. So when he uh, found the opportunity in, in front of a whole lot of witnesses, he felt like he had to, uh, you know, have that shock factor. Like, look, yeah. look, Tupac, look, <laughs> yeah. uh, look, everyone. Yeah. Uh, look, uh, I know I've been a corny rapper my whole life, but, you know, I, I, could, be, <laughs> corny rapper. I, I could do something in front of everybody. He made a song about Mike Tyson or somebody or, mm-hmm. you know, you know, over his life. Mm-hmm. He was always cut and dry. He was going to run for president. Yeah. You're right. You know, actually read his book you know uh, right. you know he's an inspiring character right. so for him to have that platform he just got excited and, you know he got yeah. he, he got excited and he fumbled on the, on the one yard line from yes. everybody big fumble yes because that that's that, legacy yeah so that's going to be on his on his shirt for the rest of his life yeah but we got to give the brother a, a pound on his back he just signed a 23 million dollar deal for a uh, bad boy four mm-hmm. he's a uh, he's on he's on the up climb right now you good know? so you know just stay tuned Le, yeah. he might have been knocked down like ali but you know he wasn't knocked out yeah you know so nah. you know just get excited it, it, yeah. it ain't that i'm just saying he he tried to have this squeaky clean thing yeah. and then he gets older and then goes crazy like yeah i'd rather him just be crazy early yeah and then you know what i mean that had i don't think that that outburst had anything to do with what chris rock said exactly i think it was a combination of things it was a build-up absolutely yeah what he was going through with his wife and and things of that nature um but you know i'm praying for the dude i I love will to death man i I really hope he gets out of this he just sued chris rock for defamation though yeah i don't know where that's going it's corny man you know you slap that dude. Yeah, How are you yeah. going? alone, man. Now nah, you corny. Like, yeah. It's his, it's, it's, it's Jada. She's behind the scenes. Uh, you know, of the, course. The puppet master. Yes. Because she's the, yep. she's the puppet be master. the man of the house, man. Something's yep. got to, got to like change here. What's yep. going on? Yeah. You know, she ain't making stovetop. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she ain't making stove top and she at the red table spilling all the beans. <laughs> That's what's making him get upset. She's sitting at the red table and so you know, let's pray for that union, you yeah. know. And, uh, but, but I'll say one thing, not to currency. If you don't humble yourself, you'll be humiliated. Yeah. You know, so just let's just stay humble and appreciative for what we have today. Yeah, yeah. I absolutely. Agree. Absolutely. I agree wholeheartedly. Well, if you don't have anything else you want to tell, it might be a wrap, but I want to give you the floor. If there's anything else you can think of or something we didn't ask you. Yeah, you know, one thing that I just want to end with, I always try to end on a good note, yeah, absolutely. is... You know, what I see out there right now is desperation. Just like you said, hey, you know, when you're desperate, you rob, you steal, right. mm. you know, you're, you're out there thieving, right? Mm-hmm. So I feel like as we go through this market shift, you're going to see a lot of people leave the industry, but you're you're also going to see a lot of um, agents and loan officers alike doing a lot of bad things. True. So for the audience out there, man, I encourage you to not do anything out of desperation. I have seen many, many stories and I've, I've seen it with my own eyes of agents and loan officers alike doing things out of desperation, getting caught up right. and losing your licenses completely. Yeah, okay. you can go to jail. Yeah. I knew an agent that was mm. making a quarter million dollars a year, mm-hmm. you know, did this one little thing. License is gone. You can never come back into the industry. Mm. Yeah. You just gave up a quarter million a year. Right. Mm. For, and, one, for one loan. Right. Right. <laughs> for one transaction. Yeah. Right? One loan. Mm. And another, another thing that I want to mention is we all know we live in the great United States of America. Money makes money. Right. And if you're missing out on the quarter million, now you're talking about future investments that you're missing out on, too. True. Right. So it's, it's just not worth it. And another thing that I want to end on is if you see somebody and they need help, help them out. Mm. Right. You know, help them out. But like I said, I don't want to contradict myself. I've made a personal decision to help out select individuals because I learned my lesson last year. I was helping too many people. I got screwed too many times. So for me personally, I am still going to help to a certain extent. Sure. And if if you show me that you are appreciative and that you are loyal, I will continuously help. I will give you the shirt off my back. That's just the type of dude that I am. Right. But if as soon as I see a red flag, I'm out. 
I, I think the, one of the most dangerous people is, is a person that doesn't um, appreciate a good person. Yes. Mm. I, to me, that's one of the most dangerous individuals you'll ever mm -hmm. see. So if you see that, run. Yes. <laughs> yes, run. yes, yes, yes. Like but I'm also uh, encouraging individuals that are doing goodwill because goodwill right. is good business. Yes. Absolutely. You have to just have yes. discernment. And like you said, when you see that red flag, it, it's for a reason. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Absolutely. Like I said, God tests you, man. And God will also give you a lot of signs. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Um, I've noticed a lot of that um, at the end of last year and into this year is mm -hmm. those signs are coming a lot more frequently. And I'm very appreciative of that. And I'm just like, thank you. I'm out. <laughs> I'm out. Yeah. So if somebody wants to get in touch with you to get a mortgage or to get advice on, on the industry, how can they find you? Yeah. Yeah. You can find me on social media. Uh, IG handle is the broker in a hoodie, the broker in a hoodie. H O O D I E. Uh, you can reach me by my cell phone, 619 882 9776. You can also reach me by email, eric at fiducia, F I D U C I A H L dot com. Uh, on Facebook, I'm just under Eric Ty. I got a big head, so you'll recognize me right away. <laughs> oh, what, how'd you come up with the name? I forgot to I ask like that. I like that. Fiducia? That's a good yeah. one. Okay, so. Um, Fiducia is Latin, right? Okay. Uh, we wanted, um, uh, what was it? It was, oh, high trust. Okay. We wanted our mortgage company to be high trust home loans. Okay. But we got a notification back from the DRE and they were, <laughs> they were like, hey, if you want trust in any part of your name, you have to jump through all these extra hoops. Oh. So one of our partners at the time said, hey, you know, uh, high trust in Latin is Fiducia. Oh, so okay. Fiducia home loans, same thing. We okay. can we can skip all those loopholes or we can skip all those extra hoops that we have to jump through. Oh. So fiducia home loans. Almost like fiduciary duty. Exactly. Oh, wow. wow. And Gems. one more thing, fiducia. Gems. Yeah. Powerful. Powerful. Gems. Powerful. How is the currency? <laughs> Powerful. There we go. <laughs> fiducia actually just merged uh, uh, with a bigger partner, a bigger entity called Nextdoor Lending. Okay. Um, love those partners out of Detroit, Michigan. Yeah, you were um, telling me. Yeah. Those guys. They're huge players. Uh, with UWM, they're actually the number nine uh, producing brand brokerage in the country in, in the country wow. right so we're, we're all over and we're, we're taking over we're licensed in I think 27 states at the moment we're shooting for 40 by the end of the year Perfect. Um, so HELOCs mobile homes you know obviously the regular conventional FHA VA USDA financing we all have it um, and so if you need financing Give us a ring. Give us a shout. And you're hiring as well, right? Yeah, we're we're hiring to an extent. You know, we sure. don't want to grow too quickly. I've, I've made the mistake of growing the team too quickly, and it all just crumbles down. So we want to take it day by day. We want to make sure that the talent that we're bringing on um, is worth it. I, I'm hiring too. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Inter interview with you first. Yeah, yeah <laughs> absolutely. Um, well, it looks like it's a wrap. I definitely appreciate you coming yeah, on the show. Yeah. You're welcome back anytime. Thank you're you, now brother. An alum of Knowledge to Currency University. Absolutely, and I want to thank you for your time and energy. Of course, man. Uh, you My know, pleasure. the more the more you owe, the, the more you know, the more you owe. Yeah, you know what I mean. So thank yeah. you for sharing. Of course, of course, anytime. Yeah. So it's a wrap. Now it's the currency episode thirty-five. Peace. <laughs>